so we are moving on to now another data link another layer to wireless and mobile networks again i teach whole course on wireless and mobile calls and i am confused about the numbers now um so some 570 some number is um, wireless but this is again you know one module summary of that whole semester course okay hopefully you will want to take the whole semester course because there is so much wireless going on right now everything is wireless and there are so many protocols from wi-fi to bluetooth to zigbee to you name it iot and all of these are covered in the other course here we are just giving you a flavor okay so we'll talk about why makes wirelinks what makes wirelinks very difficult what are the different local area networks and personal area networks how do the cellular cellular is also wireless so we talk about that also in the class in the other class how the mobility is managed with wireless you can go around and then you have to keep you connected and how does it change the higher layers so there are several sections in the book and we are going to go section by section the first section is what makes wireless difficult and how we handle it so we will talk about what is mobile versus wireless what are the challenges why do we need base stations what is cdma so mobile is not the same thing as wireless okay wireless means no wires if you cut the wires and still communicate that is wireless mobile means you are moving right so you could be moving with a wire i mean i could have this is wired right now and i could be just moving around but not go too far right not very convenient so mostly it is common that the mobile most of the mobile things are wireless but that is not necessary right so the relationship between mobile and wireless is like this most of the stuff which is mobile is wireless but you could have wired mobility an example of wired mobility is that i am connected to the ethernet here and disconnect go to my office and connect it again to another ethernet and go to hotel and connect to another ethernet and probably some things will continue some things will not continue tcp will clearly give up but if i was doing udp i can continue move watching the same movie and things will be okay so that is wire the mobility right all right so so that is one thing second thing is because there is wireless wireless means totally open means everybody can hear it in wired at least i can run the wires under the table and you cannot see it you cannot cut it you cannot touch it with wireless people outside the door can hear me right in fact if you are using a wireless keyboard in your office in your room people outside the building several feet away can listen to every key that you are typing right so wireless is open mobile and because it is mobile it it raises several routing and addressing issues so those are totally different issues those are mostly layer 3 issues as to how do we send the packets to you and the wire issues are wireless issues are mostly how to just cross the air so here are the challenges first of all there is a shadow and multi path so think about this if wire was not a radio wireless was not a radio it was a light then if i put a, my hand here there is a shadow something here will not be able to receive that light right same thing happens with wireless if i have a transmitter and i put a building in front of it there is some area behind the building where there is a shadow and you will not receive the wireless okay multi path wireless can go like this reflect and come back reflect from that one and come back reflect from that cell and come back so when you get a signal it is five copies of the same signal at different delays so it's not the same signal it's, it's at different times right and becomes very confusing so 
interference. And then even if these shadows and multipaths were not there, there is a lot of interference. If you talk, I talk, everybody talks, there will be interference. Variable channel and anything that changes, the wind moves, that changes. Channel is very difficult, right? So that way there are lots of errors and therefore you need retransmissions. You need, you know, other things that you didn't need with Ethernet. Transmitters and receivers moving at high speed. If we start moving, then there is a Doppler effect. What is Doppler? You know Doppler, is, they might teach you in some places that if you have a train coming towards you, the sound is different to your ears than the train going away from you. Why is that? Because the frequency changes. When the train is moving, the frequency of the horn is actually fixed, but it, it sounds different to you because this more cycles, you get more cycles per second if it is coming towards you and less cycles per second if it is going away from you. That is called Doppler. Low power transmission and now we cannot just put a 100 kilowatt power anywhere because people are there and they are affected by wireless, we don't know that. So the transmissions are limited. So everybody is transmitting here. This is transmitting my laptop, that laptop, that laptop, my phone, your phone. There are so many transmitters in this room, we are getting a lot of radiation. Right? Now, we don't know whether it is good or bad, but we do know that I would not want to live under a tower. Right? Because under the tower, some old towers do transmit kilowatts of power. Right? And the power that these guys are transmitting is called microwave. Right? And the microwave that you use at home are also using the same <laughs> microwave. I like the difference between this microwave and that microwave is this is milliwatt and, and microwatt. That is kilowatt. If you put your hand under kilowatt, you know that is going to hurt. All right. So low power transmission and therefore we cannot go very far. 100 milliwatt in Wi-Fi base station versus 100 kilowatt in the TV tower. TV towers go 45 kilometers. How can they go 45 kilometers? Because they just bombard. License exempt is spectrum. And second thing is that we use license exempt because we haven't paid for it. All this is spectrum, we are using it. Whereas if you license for it, like the telephone companies do, they have to pay millions of dollars and billions of dollars to get those channels. So they have a different protocol than us who are using it for free. Limited spectrum and whatever spectrum is there is always fills up. Original Wi-Fi was 2 megabits. Non-new standards allow up to 200 megabits. Actually that is a small number now. I know protocol which run at terabits now. So we are moving up. No physical boundary. So security is an issue because you cannot bound. You cannot say well this is the building and the transmission will not go out of this building. Mobility means seamless handover and we need to be handing over. This picture basically shows you the shadow and multipath actually. It is showing you that you might get something directly and something will be blocked here and then maybe come around or something. So anyway, shadows and multipath. Actually, radio is very similar. Radio and light are same. They are both electromagnetic spectrum, electromagnetic waves. And so radio waves they behave exactly like light waves. Except that depending upon the wavelength, they are blocked by a small object versus big objects. So the longer wavelength can go around big objects, light is very small wavelength. It cannot go around any object. It can not go around my finger. But radio waves can go around my finger. All right, so understand that the wireless is not easy. All right. So now there are two ways to do it. If we have two computers, they want to talk to each other, they could just talk to each other and that is called peer to peer. Right? Or we could put a base station and then they could talk to the base station and that is called basically infrastructure based. Both have their advantages and disadvantages. 
if there are only two stations, adding a third one is 50% overhead, why have it, right? So for two stations, it's not necessary to have this station. But if there are 100 stations, then it will be really confusing. It will be much easier to just do a base station and let be let it be in charge and have all the complicated circuitry in it and everybody else be very simple. Right? So for most cases, base station is, it is cheaper to have a base station than to put everything that base station has into every computer. So there are two modes. Peer-to-peer, -peer, which is called ad hoc, are infrastructure based, which is basically base station. Now, so the advantage is that two stations can communicate. All stations have the same logic. They have both, they have the complete logic to coordinate and no infrastructure suitable for a small area. If you are in the mountain, you know, obviously you don't have a base station and you want two computers to com connect, best thing is to do ad hoc. Infrastructure based is good otherwise. Sim stations can be very simple. Base system provides for everything going, including the connection to the outside and they provide location tracking, directory authentication, etc., etc. And it turns out that Wi-Fi, which is called A2 2.11, provides both modes, ad hoc and wireless. So we really no, don't save any cost. Every computer comes with both mode. Every computer has ad hoc capability and the base station capability. All right? And so, if you don't have base station, if you have two computers in your room, they can talk to each other, if you know how. Right? They, they can talk to each other by Wi-Fi. They can talk to each other by Bluetooth, of course. Right? So, that is peer-to-peer. -peer. By the way, Bluetooth is 100% peer-to-peer. -peer. Bluetooth does not require a base station. We are not, I, I think we have one slide on Bluetooth here. But um, basically, Wi-Fi is mostly access-based. I mean, I don't know how many of you have ever used two stations and talked to, without a base station. I have done once in a while. But whenever I do it, I got to figure it all out. Because I forget, it is so rarely I do it. Okay? But, so everywhere we have access points and we just go through the access points. Now there are many, there are many Wi-Fi stations and there are many Wi-Fi protocols or many wireless protocols. 802.11 has many numbers, 11N, A, G, B, etc., etc., 15, 16, and then there are, there are 2G, 3G, 4G, etc., etc. Now they're all for different distances and different data rates. If you want to go very short distance, and very low rate, you use 15. And higher rate, you use 11B, and then higher rate, you use AG, and then even higher rate, you use 11N. You want to go longer distance, then you have to start going to cellular networks, and these are 2G, 3G, et cetera, et cetera, including 16, which is known as BiMax. So this picture shows lots of um, standards in a cryptic way, in somewhat cryptic way, um, because it has all these names which we haven't explained to you, and I've tried to put something outside. So this is basically this is 2G. 2G is very low speed data. Then 3G became faster. Then 3G basically enhanced became faster and faster all the way, and this doesn't really show 4G. Okay. On the indoor side, we have 15, which we will cover a little bit. 11, we are going to cover today itself. So 11 goes up to N here in this picture, but now we have much faster AC. So we'll just explain all those terms. And basically, the wireless technologies are different for different distances and different speeds. Clearly, as you go longer distance, you cannot go at the same speed. So, these technologies go long distances, they go at lower speed, shorter distances can go higher speeds.
So this is a distance um, bandwidth product as we call it, a distance throughput rate product. And this is that alpha principle again, okay? But, um, uh, so this picture simply shows you different variety of things. Now moving on to two different things, we talked about that the wireless can have infrastructure, which means a base station or a tower, or may not have an infrastructure, in which case two people can talk directly. And they might be just going one hop, or they might be going multiple hops. That makes four possibilities. If you just go one hop with the infrastructure, that is basically the standard thing, that you go very first hop, you go to the infrastructure, you reach the tower, or use the base station. Um, and um, you may go through a lot of hops. If you go through lots of hops, that is called a mesh network. Mesh, M-E-S-H. Mesh stands for basically a interconnection, mesh. And if you go hop by hop with a, without infrastructure, multiple hops, that is called mobile ad hoc network. This is called ad hoc networks, and this is called mobile ad hoc networks. And so that is called MANET, or MANE, if you think it is French, but it is not French. Right? So MANET is, um, is mobile ad hoc networks, and this is being applied to cars. So next generation cars will have internet connection, and they will be able to talk to each other and to the system, and that will be called VANET, Vehicular Ad Hoc Networks. Okay? All right. So we now know the normal uh, wireless networks, then we have ad hoc networks, mesh networks, MANET, and VANET. Any questions about those terms? Clear? Okay. I hope. All right. Now, in wireless networks, we cannot use carrier sense multiple access. Collision detection, actually. We can use carrier sense multiple access, but we cannot use collision detection. We cannot detect collision. And the way we detect collision on the wire networks is that if you are transmitting and I am transmitting, both transmitting at the same time, I can hear your signal and you can hear my signal. Right? On the wireless, that may not happen. So here is a hill. Behind the hill, this computer is transmitting to that station. In front of the hill, this station is transmitting to that station. Both of them will collide. But they will not be able to hear each other. You can see that? They are each in each other's shadow. Right? So, so basically they will collide, but they will not detect the collision, so you cannot rely on collision detection. This is called hidden node problem. B and A can hear, B and C can hear, but A and C cannot hear. B and A can hear, B and C can hear, but A and C cannot hear. And so they may start transmitting, and they may and they may basically collide and not know. So we cannot do that. We cannot use CSMACD. So we have to do something different, and we will come to that. But before we come to that solution, there is one more thing that we need to do, and that is that we need to do something with the spectrum itself, with the frequency band that we have. There are many ways to share the spectrum, and one we already talked about is time division multiple access. Then we talked about another one we talked about is um, frequency division multiple access. But there is a third one called code division multiple access, CD, CDMA. And the easiest way to understand that, you remember how do we, we talked about time division multiple access. I should have that cartoon here, which I don't. Is that you know in time division multiple access, you will be given a time during which we speak. Nobody else speaks, right? CSMA is actually, in some sense, similar thing. You listen before you talk, right? Now, think about a party where everybody is talking at the same time. 
what was that method aloha right now think about in the same party if everybody is talking in different language somebody is talking in chinese somebody is talking in english somebody is talking in indian hindi whatever then would the situation be better actually for human being it is better if you are if if you are talking in english and somebody else is speaking in chinese it doesn't it doesn't interfere with your listening somehow i don't know how i mean you hear this word but they are filtered out is it true have you noticed that so the other languages are filtered out by our ears because they are using a different code and similarly in the computer networks they decided that why don't we use different code so that people can filter out the code that they are not speaking themselves so you decide a code you decide a code and so we decided to use a code 01000101010 this is the code we decided for a zero so whenever i want to send a 10 bit i will not send 01 bit i will send just these 10 bits 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 bits maybe so i'll send these many bits is a code when you get that code you know that this is a zero and i'll send just the opposite of that complement of that for a one when you get that code you know that this is one okay so you are in sub one bit you are going to send nine bits now but the advantage is 2 raised to 9 people can have their own code and they will look for their code actually not all 2 raised to 9 can use it so there are some codes which are very close to each other so you don't use them anyway so this is called a spreading factor code bits upon data bits these are the code bits these are the data bits for each data bit if i counted correctly we have 10 bits and 9 bits let's see 4 or a 10 bits sorry so the the spreading factor is 10 we have spread our bits 10 times more we have sent 10 times more bits okay signal bandwidth is 10 times the data bandwidth if you are going to send 1 bit per second you are going to send 10 times more means 10 bits per second now and you will have to tell the receiver that our code is this otherwise the receiver will not know what code to use so there is a code synchronization issue and second thing is you don't want other people to be using the same code it's like this if somebody is speaking american english and somebody is speaking british english they will see interference quite a bit because their codes are very close right so you don't want to have very close codes so there are people who decide what codes are good what codes are not good what will interfere and so you will be given a code which is good so this is called cdma code division multiple access if you were to look into 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 in time your bits were like this you were sending square bits square pulses or rectangular pulses this is on this is on zero right if you were to translate that and i don't know whether you will understand how to translate it but if we were to translate that and this is starting in electrical engineering not in computer science this signal in frequency domain looks like this if this if plot as a function of time this is how the power is if you plot as a function of frequency the power is highest at this frequency and then goes down at other frequencies so it has a frequency peak now when you send 10 bits the power domain it looks like this basically the power is everywhere there is no very sharp peak the peak is you know kind of come down and so basically what you have done is you have is spread the spectrum is spread this is what you call is spread the spectrum what you have done is You, instead of this you have spread it like this instead of you know having 5 hertz you now have 50 hertz or 500 hertz okay now so this is called direct sequence spread spectrum direct sequence is spread spectrum there is another method of spread spectrum that we will discuss next 
but this is direct sequence. We don't do too much work. We just take directly a bit and translate it into code bits. So this is called DSSS CDMA. Direct sequence spread spectrum CDMA. All right. So question about code division multiplexer CDMA. Any questions so far? Please. If it is not clear, I can go one more time. Yeah. Okay, I am hard of hearing, so again loudly. Right, right, right. So, <clears throat> so I have a, a, here the word orthogonal. Basically, so when you select the codes, people find out how much is the correlation. If you have a code like one person has a code like this, and one person has a code like this. By the, by the way, this 10 bits can be written as a vector in a 10 dimensional. Right? It is a vector in 10 dimension. So, if you take a vector which are very close, they will have a lot of correlation and interference. On the other hand, if the vectors are like this, then they will have the least amount of interference. So, that is what is called orthogonal, 90 degrees in 10 dimension. And generally, we don't use 10 dimension. We use 512 dimensions. 512 code bits for each bit. 1,000 code bits for each bit. All right. So, think in that dimension, you know, you find the codes which have very little correlation. Those are called orthogonal. Yeah. Exactly. So basically what happens is if you do have 2 raised to 10 people trying to share or you know very close to that maybe one fourth of that or one tenth of that, then you are not losing anything because everybody, the total is still the same. Right? Everybody is using one hundredth or one, one two raised to 10 time of that, right? One thousandth of that. But thousand people are using it so the total throughput is same for the same spectrum. So yes, for busy period this is good. If you have nobody else is speaking and you are using this code, then you are wasting your time, right? Any other question? All right. So here is an example of CDMA. This person, user 1 and user 2. There are two users, sender 1 and sender 2. This has selected a code which is shown here. 1101010000 okay minus 1 is you know in sub minus 1 in sub 0 we are putting minus 1 there right so lower voltage minus negative voltage so we want to send a 0 we send this when we want to send a 1 we send this and this person is sending two ones so it has selected a different code which is shown here all right these codes somehow get added in the air and on the channel something cancels out. If this guy sends a plus 1 and this guy sends a plus 1, that becomes 2. And if they send plus and minus, they get 0. So this is what you get on the air. When it comes to the receiver, receiver correlates it with whoever it wants to receive with. And let's say it is on trying to receive with first one. It will correlate with that, and um, and then it will somehow come out that okay, yeah, it, it, it sends zero and one. Okay, and um, so basically the receiver has the same code, and they will try to correlate with whatever is received with that signal, trying to trying to figure out what the sender might have sent, and they will get with a very high probability the correct data bits. Okay. Now, there is a lot of correlation and mathematics behind this, which you are not supposed to, I mean, basically, we are not going to teach you right now. But, um, but the idea, I just want to show you the idea here is that if people have different codes, when, they, when the whole mixture comes in, in the mixture, we try to correlate with what we are looking for, and we can find it. D11 is equal to minus 1, D01 is equal to 1. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. First of all, um, D2 
is sending 1 1 so this is exact replica d1 is sending opposite so that should be actually the, the picture is wrong you're right the 1 and minus 1 should be just the opposite of each other which they are not yeah no no that's good that's that's very good so does everyone understand the, hold on before i complete does everyone understand the mistake in that picture in the for the user one the mistake is that this is one and minus one and they are, they are same code is sending yeah okay go, go ahead somebody else okay Okay, all right, all right, all right, all right. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Did you say, want to say the same thing? Okay, good, good, good. Okay, all right, good. All right, so this is not the output, this is the input. This is just the code. The output is this times that, this times that. And um, if you multiply by one, this value, and multiply this by minus one, by the time they get out, that's how you get a zero there. Right? And um, now let's just double check the second code bit. So this one will be multiplied by minus 1. We will get minus 1. And here this will be multiplied by 1, minus 1. Second bit will be minus 2. Okay? Minus 1, minus 1 is minus 2. So basically you have to multiply these two and then add here. So this is the multiplier. These bits and this code get multiplied and then they get added. Thank you. All right. Um, and now similar things happen here basically is that you take these bits and you take these codes and then you do multiplication and then you do some addition and then you, do, you will figure out that this is more than more than five bits or six bits are matching and therefore this is my code or something like that you know and and it'll come up with a minus one or plus one yeah they don't need to know okay so question is how many how does the receiver know how many senders there are and what are their codes we don't care we you see in this formula here we just use the user one's code No, big M is what is gets on the air, regardless of what gets on the air, we just take what is on the air. Oh, you are saying to threshold it? No, so the, well, let me explain the thresholding too. The threshold is not big M. Threshold is with, with number of bits per, number of code bits per bits. In this case, we have 10. We still have 10, 4, I think 8 maybe. Am I writing, reading? Because this is at such an angle. Okay, so let's see. So we have 4 plus 4, 8 bits per, 8 code bits per, so the threshold is related to 8, number 8, not number M. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right. So that is a DSSS CDMA. So there is homework 7A. This is a 4-bit code. And very simple, only one bit, and then uh, draw the waveforms. That's all. You don't need to suppose to receive. Receiver only, you have to draw only this big waveform, this one. Okay? This part is not in the question. Can everybody draw this waveform? Now that we have discussed it, you multiply that and add it, multiply that and add it and write there. All right, there is one more method of frequencies for the CDMA which is not discussed in the book. And that is more common. I was really shocked to see that it is not in the book. So I've added it. Please listen carefully. 
This method is called frequency hopping spread spectrum. So another way to do the coding is that you select a code. You have the same code, I have the same code and we use it to gen basically it's like a random number generator. You select a random number generator and I select a random number generator. If we use both the same random number generator, if we both use the same seed, the starting point, you will get the same sequence. Okay? So the random number generators, they work, the way work is that you give them one number, they give you another number. There is a formula, feed into that formula, you get another number. Then you feed the second number, you get the third number. You get the feed third number, you get the fourth number. These are all very random numbers, but there is a formula behind it how they are connected. So if we have the same formula, then <coughs> we will generate the same numbers. And we use that number to decide what frequency we transmit on. So here is the frequency channel. We divide that into many channels, let's say 500 channels. Actually, let's be more realistic. Let's say we divide them into 70 channels. And then we generate a random number between 1 and 70 and then I transmit at that frequency and you having the same code will know exactly where I am transmitting and receive it there and then we, I move off. At the next slot I will transmit at a different frequency and next slot I will transmit at a still different frequency and I will keep hopping. Right? That is another method of spread spectrum, RCDMA. This is what is actually used in the world. DSS is not used anymore. I mean, I shouldn't say anymore, but really this is what Bluetooth does. Frequency spectrum, frequency, uh, frequency hopping spread spectrum. So I'm surprised that this book is, uh, doesn't have it. So I, I want you to know it, okay? And so this is called pseudo-random frequency hopping. What is pseudo-random? See, the true random numbers cannot be predicted. They are not related. But the random numbers that we generally use in, in our calculations, in our math, in our simulations, they are pseudo. They are pseudo means half random because if I gave you the formula, you can predict the whole thousand numbers from beginning to the end. Okay? If you don't know the formula, they are random. Okay? Pseudo-random frequency happening and express the power over a wide spectrum. So here is the thing. Your signal will look like this without hopping. Without frequency hopping, you will be at one frequency. And the noise is here. Noise power is here. So this is frequency on the x-axis and the y-axis we have the power. With frequency hopping, your power is everywhere. In fact, you are below the noise. If you think about the average, at any instant you are above the noise. But if you take over a time average, you are below the noise. So frequency hopping spread spectrum works as follows. And it was not developed for this method. This was developed for military. You know for what? So that nobody could listen to you. That is why it was developed so that, you know, they don't know what frequency you are. They cannot tune, tune to your frequency. The enemy cannot tune to your frequency because you are hopping all over. That is why it was developed. And actually it was developed not by the military. It was developed by an actress, Hedy Lamar. Hedy Lamar actually holds the patent on this. And the reason she invented this is not for any of this stuff that we are talking about. She was just working with harmonium and piano and, you know, some music stuff. And she was, ex she was seeing the effect of frequency changes. Right? And she, she, she said, yeah, this is a great way to do whatever she was trying to do. And so she got a patent in 1942 and then military took it and they used it for anti-jamming. And so narrow band interference cannot jam it. Narrow band means if somebody is trying to, if somebody puts a, some kind of jamming signal, let's say here, so much, that will not affect it. If you just put a jamming signal here, only the blue will be affected, but we will continue rest of the time. Okay? So this is the more commonly used CDMA.
FHSS Frequency Hopping Spread Spectrum CDMA Code Division Multiple Access. We still have a code, but that code is used to decide what frequency to transmit on. Is this clear? Again, this is not in the book, so please ask right now if something is not clear, because you cannot go back and read it again. I mean, you can, of course, find it on Wikipedia or some other place. But this is very important. All right, so that's the end of the initial part of the wireless. First is the wireless is not the same as mobile. First thing we learned is that mobile devices are, doesn't have, don't have to be wireless devices. They could be wired but they are different. So basically people use this different, the same word for both, but they are not. Mobility issues have to do with routing, layer 3. Wireless issues have to do with all the signal stuff, which is layer 1 and 2. Okay? Wireless signal is affected by shadows, multipath, interference, and Doppler shift. How many people remember what is multipath? 3, 4, okay. Everybody else forgot. All right. Basically, the wireless signal does not just go straight. It can go through the walls. It can reflect off the wall just like the light. It can come from all directions. That is multipath. What is Doppler shift? How many people know what is Doppler shift? Now, again, raise your hands. Okay, a lot more. All right. That has to do with, you know, people moving towards each other. If they're moving towards each other, what happens to the frequency? A perceived frequency increases if they are moving towards each other. You get more cycles per second. All right. A wireless network can be ad hoc or infrastructure that we talked today. So you should remember that one. Ad hoc means no what? Ad hoc means no what? I mean, what do you know, what do you don't have in ad hoc network? Base stations. And infrastructure based means base station. multi hop can be MANET and MANET stands for MANET stands for? Mobile. Yeah, mobile ad hoc networks. And uh, it is not possible to do collision detection in wireless because of the hidden node problem. And code division multiple access is what is commonly used in wireless. That is section 27.2, and you should be able to do these exercises, 3 and 4. Now we talked about its actual wireless LANs and PANs. LANs is local area networks, PANs is personal area network. So 802.11 is a LAN that we all use and 802.15 is a PAN that we all use. So we'll talk about those. Now 802.11 actually started in 1999, not very long ago. Or maybe I'm off by nine years, maybe 1990, I don't know, I don't remember exactly. But at that time it was called 802.11 and it ran at 1 or 2 megabits. 2.4 gigahertz band, 1 and 2 megabits. That is how fast it ran. That's the maximum we could do in those days. Then they figured out a better way, and then they decided 802.11b, second version of it, which ran at 11 megabits. And it used DSSS in the physical layer. However, I mean, basically, all hosts use the same chipping code. So it's not that different people are using different codes. If you are on LAN X, you are using code X. If you are LAN Y, you are using code Y. So the code is used to differentiate among different LANs. Okay, not different users of the same LAN. So if you are, suppose you are carrying two classes in the same room, I will use one code and the other instructor will use another code, people could be just listening to their code. That is how they do, DSS in physical layer. Then they actually, before B, they, they had already invented a better way, uh, but it was, so that was, that required a different change of frequency. So the, most of these ran at 2.4, but then they said if you go at 5.8 gigahertz, we can do 54 megabits with wider bands, wider channels. So that was A, but people didn't like it, so B actually came first. 
because nobody wanted to move to 5.8. That requires a whole new wireless stuff. I mean, like, you know, it becomes more expensive. If you have 2.4, everything, all the devices are here. We can just make minor changes and go from 11 to 11B. But to go from 11 to 11A, you need all new radio stuff, all new wireless radio stuff. So that band change did not happen. Then we went to 11G. We took the best of A and B and combined that, and so we got 54 at 2.4 gigahertz. So remember, 2.4 gigahertz is the frequency band we are using. So the frequency band you saw, you know, is you know from zero to infinity. At some point, it becomes light, but um, 2.4 gigahertz is called microwave band. I mean, basically, microwave is actually 2.4 gigahertz. So that is where we use most of this stuff. So at that band, we could do with 11G, we could do 54. Then 11N came about, which takes both 4 and 5.8, 2.4 and 5.8, and then uses even bigger channels, and they get up to 200 megabits. And the story continues. Every four or five years, we change the speed by changing different things that we will see. And um, so right now, we are up to not 200 megabits. We are up to several gigabits. So these are all different file layers, physical layers. So when you have 11A, 11B, 11G, 11N, the data link layer is still the same. Layer 2 is still the same. The physical layer is different. How the bits are sent is different. All have the same MAC layer. All use CSMACA. Collision, sorry, carrier sends multiple access with collision avoidance. And I will explain that in a minute. But CA is for collision avoidance. So that is the access method used here, CSMACA. All have base station and ad hoc version. So all of them have run in both ways. You can have a base station or you may not have the base station. Supports multiple priorities, and you can have high priority traffic and low priority traffic. Supports time critical and data traffic. You might have a video which is time critical and data traffic which is not time critical. And all of them have power management, which means they sleep most of the time. Okay, power management means your battery should last long, right? And so wireless devices, as we will see in 11, they sleep most of the time. The more they can sleep, the more your battery will last. Okay? So there are lots of statements on this. I am just making them those statements. Some of them I will come back and do one more time. But any questions about any of this? Yeah. Uh, what's so special about 2.4 and 5.8? What's so special about 2.4 and 5.8? <laughs> so basically the whole world started from lower frequencies. If you go back to the old radios, they used to run at 700 megahertz, actually maybe even 30 megahertz, and then went to 100 megahertz, then into 700. Television runs at 700 megahertz. Then we went higher and higher frequency, right? And so there is a whole reason why, you know, you want to go to whatever frequency. But the lower frequencies go much farther, okay? And so the whole world is starting from the lower end. And so 2.4 is the first thing that we did. Okay, and once we did it, we liked it. I and mean, basically, we don't want to just go up to 5.8 and have, you know, do. And now, if you do like 11N, which runs at both 2.4 and 5.8, you really need two radios. So, two radio amplifiers, two radio detectors, everything, all the wireless stuff is twice. Okay, any other question? Yeah. Yeah, right. So same chipping code means that basically you cannot transmit at the same time. So if I have if I have 10 people in my network, then 10 people have to cannot transmit. They cannot, they, they are sharing it not by CDMA method. They are sharing it by collision avoidance that I will discuss in a, in a minute. Right? And so we are not using CDMA here to share. We are using CDMA to share among the networks. If there are many networks here, like there are, I mean, if you look up in your thing, there are many networks operating in this room. They all use a different code. Okay. 
All right, so passive and active scanning. So how do you find out who is on? Basically, there are two ways to find out what networks are available here. Either you ask, or they announce. So one common method is that every few seconds, every base station in this room announces that, hey, I am here. I am Wustel encrypted. I am Wustel guest. And I cannot see. Maybe this one is a base station. Who knows? I don't know what that is. But anyway, so, so there are many devices here. They are announcing continuously what, what they are transmitting, what network they are serving. Okay? And then when you want to connect, you just listen to all of them and you say, okay, I like this one looks like very strong and I know their code. So receiving is difficult because everybody is transmitting a different code. So you will have to do this scanning. Scanning means you will try different codes and figure out who is transmitting. And so that takes some time. But you can figure out what are the different networks here. Once you selected a network, then you tell, okay, I want to connect to Wustel Encrypted. So you say, Wustel Encrypted, I want to connect to you. And then they will say, okay, tell me the password. And you give the password, and then you're connected. And then you know everything. And they know everything about you as well. All right? So that is called passive scanning. Passive scanning means you don't transmit anything, but you figure out who is transmitting. Active scanning is that you broadcast a signal at many codes where you say, well, hey, I want to figure out who is here. Or I could say, is Bustle encrypted here? Right? And if Bustle encrypted here, it will say, yeah, I am here. So that is active scanning. That you keep asking for the networks that you know. So now, these announcements from the base stations are called beacons. These announcements from the base stations are called beacons, and every few seconds the beacon is sent. And beacon has more than just I am here. It, it, it has a little bit more, which we'll discuss later on. So beacons are sent from the access points. Association requests are sent from the host to the access point. An association response comes back from the access point to the host. So you understand what is the association request and what is an association response. Association request is that I want to join your network. Response is yes, you are welcome. Right? Now active scanning, you send a probe request which is broadcast and probe response is sent from the access point and the association request sent to selected access point and the selected access point responds to your association request. So you can ask or you can listen, either way. You find out who is here. Okay? <coughs> now, what is CSMSCA? CSMSCA means that you really want to make sure that nobody else is talking, collision avoidance. Nobody else is talking when you are talking. To do that, you first tell everybody, look, I'm going to talk for 10 seconds. And then the receiver says that you are the only one, so go ahead and talk for 10 seconds. Then everybody knows that you are talking for 10 seconds. They will not transmit during those 10 seconds. That is called CSMACA. This is a four-way handshake. So this node wants to talk. It says ready to send, RTS. It sends an RTS message, broadcasts it. And it is quite possible that it is the only node which has sent RTS, and therefore it is successfully received at the access point, and the access point says CTS, clear to send. Okay? Now everybody is hearing at least the access point. People may not be hearing each other. A lot of people may not have heard RTS, but if you are in my network, you know you can hear me for sure. Remember that hidden node problem? Everybody should be able to access this, listen to the access point. They may not be able to hear each other. So a lot of nodes will not hear RTS, but everybody has to hear CTS and work accordingly. Once you get your reservation, then you send your data for 10 seconds, then the access point will send you an acknowledgement. You see, there is an acknowledgement right at the MAC layer, layer 2. 
why they, we need the acknowledgement here because probability of your getting lost is very high. Okay, so rather than waiting for TCP to time out, we don't worry about TCP, we just take care of here at layer 2. Okay, this is the four-way handshake, is CSMACA. Carrier sense multiple access. So I didn't talk about the carrier sense. Before you send your RTS, at that time you do sense the carrier. You do sense, like, okay, I, as far as I am concerned, I cannot hear anybody, so I should go and send, say, okay, I want to, I am ready to transmit. So that time you do carrier sense. After that it is all, you know, basically multiple access and collision is avoided because the only thing that can collide is ready to send. And that's a very small message. Okay? So if you start sending, like in the Ethernet, we just send data 10 seconds, like I mean, we don't really send 10 seconds, but 1500 bytes could be a few milliseconds. So we send um, quite a bit of time here, you know, we just um, do it, right? So the media access control is called CSMACA, carriers and multiple access with collision avoidance. Listen before you talk. If the medium is busy, you back off and avoids collision by sending a short message called RTS. RTS contains the destination address, duration of the message, and tells everyone to back off for the duration. And the destination sends clear to send. So generally the destination is access point. So you say, hey, access point, I want to talk to you for 10 seconds. So it contains the address of the access point and the message. And it cannot detect collision. So the packet is agged. So each packet is agged. And the MAC level retransmission is not agged. If it is not agged, suppose the, this last message did not come through, then you start all over again. You say ready to send again. But actually there is no thing, such thing as again. You just say ready to send. You get a CTS, send the data. You didn't get the acknowledgement, ready to send again. Okay, so everything that TCP would have done, you do it right here. 